This is the second lecture on the third day of UNAVCO's short course on GNSS data processing and analysis with Gamut Globe K and Track. My name is Mike Floyd and I'll be presenting this lecture on time series and error analysis. The issues with, that we need to deal with with uh, GNSS error analysis are firstly identifying what the sources of error are, uh, how many of those sources can actually be removed or mitigated by better modeling with understanding of the source and how it works. Uh, after that, we need to uh, understand if we have enough information to infer realistic uncertainties from the data. And we will also talk about the mathematical tools, the programs that we use uh, to estimate the errors given a certain representative model. When determining the uncertainties of uh, the parameters, really what we need for a rigorous estimate is full knowledge of the error spectrum. And this includes for GNSS data, both space and time knowledge. Uh, so the correlations uh, in space between sites and satellites, for example, and the correlation in time. So for any given site, the correlation between the estimate of day one and day seven, we need to understand both temporal and spatial correlations. Uh, this is never really realistic. Uh, any kind of error analysis in any science is not going to be perfect, uh, but we need to understand as much as possible. There are some approximations uh, that we often make in either the phase error analysis or the ultimate time series position analysis. Uh, we can reweight data to accommodate uh, the, the knowledge based on statistics. And wherever uh, we can, rather than using statistics, we actually use uh, an error model uh, that is based on uh, some kind of knowledge um, to, uh, to get the, the, the uncertainties derived rather than estimated. Uh, any kind of estimation, whether it is through a known model based on, on physics or measurements, or whether it's just the statistics associated with the phase or position time series, for example, we need some external validation as well to try and understand whether our assumptions of the error models are actually correct. So here's a summary of the tools that are available for this type of error analysis in Gamut and Globe K. And I should say, as I go through this slide, that when we talk about error analysis, we are not just talking about time series analysis for the purpose of getting velocity uncertainties more realistic. Error analysis starts at the very beginning in the Gamut phase, uh, where we are waiting phase data and pseudo range data from the receiver to take account take into account the noise of those measurements uh, in globe k we have noise associated with uh, variations over time for example seasonal terms uh, discontinuities and outliers we need to deal with those they are noise signals uh, since we are generally not interested in them um, so we either have noise or signal if we're interested in signal, everything else really is defined as noise. So in Gamut, our main uh, way of dealing with the phase noise is by using this autoclean reweight equals y in the uh, session table. This means that after the autoclean preliminary run, we get an idea of what the scatter on the phase residuals is like as a function of elevation. And we'll talk more a little bit about this in the rest of this talk, but you have also seen an example of this in previous webinars where we show the phase residuals versus elevation. Um, and we'll talk more about that again here. In Globe K, uh, cleaning the data, removing some of the noise can include uh, renaming sites to XPS or XCL to remove outliers. We can add uh, some noise to sort of rescale the uncertainties according to the normalized RMS that we might see. Uh, and we can do this with the sig underscore NEU command. 
For temporary correlated noise, we can add an MAR underscore NEU command, that's Markov noise, uh, process noise. And uh, in a Kalman filter, this is implemented as random walk noise. And we'll talk about what random walk noise is in a few slides. This is the principal method for controlling those velocity uncertainties, which uh, many of you are interested in. In uh, the .gdl files, the global directory list files, where we uh, tell globe-k which h files to use, we can actually rescale the covariance matrix of the h file by appending values, numerical values, to given h files in the GDL file. Um, this is not generally something that we do, but it is possible. You can rescale the entire covariance matrix, or you can rescale just the diagonal component, the uh, standard deviation component, the variance component. Um, and this might be useful when combining solutions uh, from different programs um, that perhaps use a, a different weighting model in the uh, in the phase processing. And furthermore, we have other utilities that are available uh, to do some of this analysis uh, or to help with some of this analysis. We have TSView and TSFit, uh, which can generate some of these XPS commands either graphically in the case of TSView uh, or automatically given certain criteria such as uh, maximum sigmas on the time series points or n sigma outliers. Uh, we also will talk about this uh, FOGMEX algorithm, what we used to call the realistic sigma algorithm. This can be used to statistically try to understand the level of the temporally correlated noise. And if we use the script shgenstats with the output of uh, tsfit or tsview with FOGMEX switched on, SHGenStats will generate these MAR NEU commands for use in the GlobeK Kalman filter. The external validation uh, can be done using, in a visual sense, uh, using SHPlotPos uh, that can then um, help us understand whether the confidence uh, level that we have and the error ellipses that we see are realistic uh, for the uh, environment that we expect. And uh, SHTS hist and SHVELHIST, which again also require GMT, can be used uh, to generate histograms of the time series and velocity uncertainty distribution, which can be helpful as well. So let's talk uh, just in an introductory sense about what the potential sources of error are in the GNSS system. First, there are signal propagation effects. Uh, this includes receiver noise, uh, the electron, purely electronic effect of measuring a broadcast signal, electromagnetic signal. Uh, the receiver is not perfect. There are ionospheric effects, uh, which we have talked about reducing by using the linear combination, for example. Uh, there are still some slightly higher order effects uh, due to the ionos ionosphere and our standard strategy now is to use uh, an ionospheric estimation file in the gamut processing, what we call an ionix file, to actually deal with those higher order terms as well as the first order term of the ionosphere that is cancelled out by taking the LC linear combination. We also have signal scattering, which we have introduced in previous lectures. Um, this includes uh, things like multipath and also the accuracy of the antenna phase model. So this includes uh, the what we call PCO, phase center offset, which is the um, distance between the nominal electromagnetic phase center, where the phase is being measured, and a reference point on the antenna, which is usually the bottom of the antenna. We also have PCVs, phase center variations, and this deals with how that phase center offset changes depending on the elevation and the azimuth of where the phase is coming from. So if the phase is coming from directly overhead at a 90 degree elevation from the zenith, 
the phase center offset might be slightly different to phase that is being measured from five degrees elevation and 40 degrees azimuth. So we also need to uh, try to model the antennas as best as possible. Then we also have atmospheric delays. Uh, we have introduced this before. We showed that the hydrostatic delay, the dry part of the atmosphere, is pretty well known, mostly relies on atmospheric pressure, uh, and that can be uh, dealt with uh, fairly easily. But the most variable, variable part of the atmospheric delay is the water vapor, the turbulent part, which is much more difficult to deal with. We also have uh, unmodeled motions of the satellites. And again, we introduced this in a previous lecture, uh, the idea that the uh, radiation pressure on the satellites is uh, an active area of research, always ongoing. Um, we, uh, oh, sorry, I'm talking about satellites here, uh, the third bullet point. Um, the, the, the second bullet point here, unmodeled motions of the station. Uh, I, I'm sorry, uh, getting my bullet points back to front here. Uh, this might include monument instability. Uh, for example, if we have uh, different kinds of, of station mounts, a deep race monument versus being on sediment, uh, for example, uh, these would lead to uh, different um, behaviors of the sites that relate to the instability, which you'll see in the time series. So we need to account for that as well. And we also have um, some of these are known pretty well, like the loading of the oceans and the atmosphere to some extent as well, uh, causes several millimeters of, of certainly vertical deformation. Oceans tends to be centimeters. Uh, we can model these. We have ocean tide loading grids, which you can load and use to correct the phase data. We can use atmospheric loading as well uh, as, as input models to gamut. Things like surface water, more local scale hydrological effects are something that we cannot model at the phase processing level uh, yet, at least. Um, and it's not something that we plan in the near future, uh, but it is also an effect that you'll see uh, on some of the time series. So we need to be able to account for all of these. So let's work our way through uh, some of these effects in the next slides and look at them in a little bit more detail. So let's look first at the phase noise. Um, this is uh, the number of epochs. So this is time on the, uh, um, the horizontal axis here. And in the top plot, the vertical axis shows you the elevation at which the phase is being modeled. So essentially what this is showing is a satellite rising above the horizon, reaching a high point uh, not quite the zenith, but basically moving overhead and then moving back down towards the horizon before it uh, is lost down below the elevation mask, which is 15 degrees here. And this shows you uh, the measurements or the residuals of the LC cycles as the satellite moves up overhead and then back down towards the horizon. And here we've marked a green area where the uh, satellite is high in the sky. It's part the phase is passing through very little atmosphere. So there's very little atmospheric uh, turbulent uh, uh, perturbation, uh, tropospheric turbulence, ionospheric uh, uh, perturbations as well. And you can see how uh, the noise, the scatter in the phase here is, is very low. At uh, mid elevations, the scatter starts to uh, rise a little bit compared to the green segment. In the yellow segment here, you can see slightly more systematic variations, a little bit more uh, high frequency scatter as well. And as we move down to the lower elevations, we are now passing through more atmosphere, more ionosphere. That means more potential perturbation to the phase signal and that is shown in the increase of uh, phase noise here. And here is a, a millimeter equivalent to the LC cycle here, just to give you an example in terms of millimeters, quite what this phase resi residual might look like. So somehow or another, we need to try to uh, not only understand, but adequately model, ad adequately account for this difference in the phase residual of the phase noise 
when the satellite is high in the sky in green versus when the satellite is low in the sky in red. And this brings us to our uh, phase weighting plot, which you have seen before, uh, but this is the first area where we really uh, weight the data according to measurements that we have and statistical model that we use. The preferred statistical model for us is um, a constant plus another constant divided by sine of elevation squared. So elevation here is from uh, the elevation mask, which is probably set to about 10 degrees for this receiver, up to 90 degrees, which is the zenith directly overhead the antenna. Again, you can see four measurements that were taken very high in the sky. We have quite low uh, scatter, uh, but it's certainly not zero, which is why we have um, this, this additional term here. Uh, as we move down in elevation, you can see that the, the uh, phase residual scatter increases quite a lot, and that is where the sign of elevation term comes in. As I say, our preferred model uh, for uh, modeling the weighting here, this is the green line, is the weighting curve. The yellow diamonds here are uh, estimates in five degree bins of the RMS scatter within that five degree bin. This model is then fit to those yellow diamonds to produce the continuous model. And so here A, the constant A is estimated to be 1.8. The constant B is estimated to be 1.3 millimeters. And this is done on a site by site basis. So this model will change, will be different depending on each site. This is a site in Southern California. Um, so this is quite a good uh, phase residual plot, but other plots you may see higher phase residuals at the low frequent, uh, sorry, low elevation end. You may also see higher frequencies, uh, sorry, higher um, RMS uh, at the uh, higher elevations as well. So this is done on a, on a site by site basis. We run the first iteration of, of gamut, model, autoclean and solve produce uh, based on a, a, a fixed um, a priori model and then uh, using a site by site reweighting that's what is used in the second iteration and we use the site dependent model in the second iteration of model autoclean and solve one difference uh, that we would like to point out is uh, we get the question a lot of the time uh, why are the uncertainties on time series that I download, for example, from the University of Nevada, Reno uh, or other uh, institutions that use gypsy processing rather than gamut processing? Why are the uncertainties on their time series much smaller than the time series that get produced from gamut globe K? And we think that one reason is the difference in the way that gypsy and gamut deals with this phase weighting as a function of elevation. We use a one over sine elevation squared term, which means that the rise in this green line here at low elevations is more aggressive than a one over sine elevation uh, without the square uh, term. So Gypsy, we understand, uses a simple one over sine elevation weighting scheme we use one over sine elevation squared, which means that the horizontal phase data is weighted lower in gamut than it is in gypsy. And what that means ultimately for low elevation measurements, these low elevation measurements are having a big impact on the horizontal time series uncertainties. And so the more that you down weight these low elevation uh, phase measurements as we do, we apply fairly low weights to them. Uh, that will mean that the horizontal uncertainties in the time series will be slightly larger because we have down weighted these, uh, these low elevation phase here. In Gypsy, with the one over sine elevation model, which is less aggressive at the low elevation model, uh, at the low elevations, 
uh, that is likely to weight these low elevation phase measurements more highly, which means that the horizontal uncertainties are reduced because this low elevation data is, uh, it carries more weight when, when the, uh, the model is uh, one over sine elevation rather than one over sine elevation squared, which is what we use. So that's probably one reason why some of the time series that you see coming from gypsy processing, for example, from UNR, might have smaller uncertainties, particularly in the horizontal component compared to gamut and globe K processing. Uh, we think a large part of that reason is the weighting of this low elevation phase data. So let's move on to the time series characteristics now, which is a little bit more familiar to people. Um, and we'll look basically at what constitutes a time series. Uh, we have the observed position at a time i, or a point uh, in time, uh, and that is basically modeled as an initial position, x0, plus a linear term of velocity multiplied by the difference in time between uh, the time of our observation and the initial position. So that equation uh, looks like this on a graph. We have an initial position here at time zero, and we move linear, linearly in time to uh, a, a time t anywhere on this graph. But this is not really what geodetic time series look like. Geodetic time series have at least seasonal variations. So we could model that by including an annual period sinusoid. And we can define this uh, either with a cosine or a sine, it doesn't really matter. I prefer to um, use a cosine because then at the beginning of the year, uh, the, uh, a, the coefficient here, a, is the, um, the offset that you have. Um, so a here is the measurement at the beginning of the year. The, uh, inside the uh, cosine term, uh, we uh, convert our time to uh, something that we can deal with in radians by dividing by uh, the um, period, which here for an annual sinusoid would be one year. Um, so T0 here is uh, one year or 365 days. And uh, we also would uh, need to estimate a phase offset as well here. But time series uh, that we see in GNSS don't look like this either. They are not smooth symmetric sinusoids. In fact, the uh, up and down motions that we often see over the seasons are more asymmetric. And so we can deal with that asymmetry by adding a semi-annual sinusoid. When we add that term, uh, we are now dealing with, uh, okay, there's a mistake here. This should be four pi, uh, not two pi. Um, we estimate uh, what we call the seasonal term, which is a, a repeating term every year, but it is composed of this annual term plus a semi-annual semi term. And by doing this, by adding in that semi-annual term with a nominal period where T1 here is six months, uh, we get this more asymmetric appearance, which is a little bit more what we usually see in geodetic time series. If we assume, for example, that these ups and downs are due to hydrological cycles, uh, we might consider that there is uh, perhaps a snowfall that gradually accumulates over time, uh, and then there's a very rapid thaw. Uh, during a short period of time, for example, that returns us back to a situation where there's no snow on the ground, loading uh, the, the ground and showing deformation in the time series. That's just one example of how we might get this asymmetric appearance. And that's why we usually include uh, not only an annual period sinusoid, but a semi-annual period sinusoid as well. And those two terms combined is what we'll often call the seasonal term. But again, geodetic time series don't really look like this either. They generally look a bit more noisy. They're not smooth. So if I add three millimeters of white noise error to the curve that we just saw, which is here in blue, uh, we get something that looks a little bit more like a geodetic time series where the red points are the observations, the black error bars 
uh, are a nominal error and the scatter that you see from day to day is this three millimeter white noise component. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what white noise means in the next few slides, um, but basically white noise is purely time independent noise. So the noise that's applied to uh, each of these points to get the scatter has a three millimeter standard deviation and every single point is random compared to any other point. There are no correlations between these points except for the 12 month and six month, six month correlations that you see in the blue curve. The green line here is the velocity term that is what most people are generally interested in. In the presence of those seasonal terms, we need to be a little bit careful with how those seasonal terms might bias our velocity estimate. And there was a, a simple study done by Blewett and Lavalle uh, in 2002 with a brief correction to one of their figures in 2003. So make sure that you download the correction as well if you do read these papers. Um, but they showed basically what would happen to your velocity estimate if you uh, did not take into account uh, the sinusoid correctly or if you didn't have enough data to, to correctly identify or separate the velocity from the contribution of the sinusoid. And what we see uh, basically is that the bias in velocity, the difference between the real velocity and your estimated velocity when there are sinusoids in the time series uh, can be quite large. The, uh, in the case of a pure sinusoid or, or pure co-sinusoid, for less than a year's worth of data, you are seeing potential errors, uh, biases, I should say, biases in your velocity estimate of many millimeters per year. Once we get to about 2.5 years of data, those uh, velocity biases due to the seasonal terms get suppressed because we now have enough data. We, we've seen two whole cycles of the seasonal term and that gives us a, a much better estimate of the seasonal term but also in general the velocity that we estimate is no longer biased so heavily by those uh, short-term periodic signals. So this is why you'll often hear us say that when we use geodetically meaningful velocities we expect to see people produce data of at least 2.5 years in length before we get velocities that we know are not biased too much and can be interpreted appropriately. Ideally, uh, we would like three or even 3.5 years of data before we start talking about these velocities, publishing them, et cetera, et cetera. So now let's talk um, beyond the seasonal terms that the se a seasonal term is an example of temporal correlation where the temporal uh, correlation time, uh, characteristic time is 12 months or six months or a combination of 12 and six months. But that's not the only temporal correlation that we have. We have temporal correlations on all sorts of characteristic time scales. For example, here, you can see this black bar here is approximately 100 days in length. And you should be able to see that we have these correlations in time that are of a shorter period than the 365 day or six month period. We have some of these correlations here. You can see up, down, up again over the period of about 100 days. And in general, we can see temporal correlations of about 60 to 200 days, as well as these seasonal terms in general. You can see here that it's generally high in the north component at the beginning of the year, high again at the beginning of the year, high again at the beginning of the year, high again at the beginning of the year. Of the beginning of the year. That's the seasonal term. But in addition to the seasonal term, we have these more short term fluctuations. So we are seeing temporal correlations on many different characteristic timescales here, and we need to account for all of those. 
So let's look briefly at what this time series or any time series might look like in the frequency domain. And this involves spectral analysis uh, to try and see what uh, an appropriate error model might look like. So these, uh, this figure here is taken from uh, Williams and others, 2004. Uh, many Williams papers in the mid 2000s deal with this problem of uh, the spectral analysis, the frequency content or periodic content, however you like to think about things, uh, that is exhibited in, um, in time series. And what we see here basically, uh, certainly in the, in the horizontal components, north and east components in the top two panels, is that as we go to very high frequencies, that's very low periods, like daily variations, that would be high frequency, this curve here flattens out. It has a gradient of about zero. And as we'll show in the next slide, a gradient of about zero in a, um, in a, uh, a frequency plot, a spectral plot such as this, is indicative of white noise. So that is, that is frequency independent or time independent. Um, so a gradient of zero means that it doesn't matter what frequency or what period we're, we're measuring at, the level of noise is the same. So that's time independent noise, that's white noise. However, at lower frequencies, we see a gradient to this uh, frequency spectrum. And that means that as we go to uh, longer and longer periods, lower and lower frequencies, we see higher levels of noise in the time series. And this is what we need to take into account when we look at the temporal correlations in the time series that will eventually affect our velocity uncertainties. This is naturally uh, limited by the length of the time series. We cannot estimate frequencies lower than about half uh, of the time series length. Uh, so a summary of this spectral analysis um, approach is basically if we take a power law fit to that, those gray spectrums that we just saw. The power law fit would be the, the uh, black line. A gradient of zero indicates white noise, that's time independent noise. A gradient of minus one would indicate what we call flicker noise. And a gradient of minus two is what we call random walk noise. And uh, um, uh, any non-integer uh, spectral index, they don't have to be integer values. Um, uh, is, is just termed power law noise. If that uh, power law, if that power k uh, is in the range one to minus one, uh, we call that fractional white noise. And for a good discussion of, of these types of noise and spectral analysis, uh, we again refer you back to some of Simon Williams' papers. When we implement this in uh, computational terms, the problem with doing error analysis this way or time series analysis this way is that it's very computationally intensive. And as I said before, no model captures reliably the lowest frequency part of that spectrum, which if we have negative powers, is actually the highest power part of the spectrum where we see the most noise. So let's take a step back and talk about some of these terms uh, white and, and random walk noise uh, to give you a bit more of a visual sense of what they really mean. So what is white noise? White noise is time independent noise. So this is uncorrelated from time series point to time series point. There is no correlation between the two points. The magnitude of uh, the time independent noise has a continuous probability function like a Gaussian function uh, and it will be randomly distributed in direction if we're thinking about north, east and up uh, components. So here is a little cartoon to uh, sort of demonstrate this. In red will be the true displacement per time step. So you can imagine here this represents one time series point in north and east uh, over, over one time step, let's say a day. 
if we add some noise to that, that's what this black vector will be. This is the independent uh, white noise error. And so what we actually measure is the true uh, displacement plus the noise within the system and the blue is our actual time series estimate. On the second day, this black uh, um, perturbation due to the independent white noise, again, is independent. It has nothing to do, it has no knowledge of what this previous uh, error was. And our time uh, and our actual observation in blue is then here. If we add that up over time, you can see these random black vectors being added at each time step. That leads us to have uh, an estimate on our velocity over time uh, that is very close to what we see in the theoretical true displacement per time. And that uncertainty, that, that velocity uncertainty or displacement difference is proportional to one over the square root of the number of data points that you have. So what about uh, non-white noise, what we call color noise? Uh, depending on the, uh, the term, uh, we sometimes refer to pink noise or red noise or brown noise, depending on that spectral index. So this is time dependent or correlated noise. Um, and uh, there's a power law, we could have a first order, order Gauss-Markov. There's many different ways of of, of modeling um, time dependent noise. But the idea here is that the convergence of the true velocity with our, uh, our observations to the true velocity is slower than with the white noise um, uh, model that you just saw, which means that our velocity uncertainty is larger. So let's demonstrate that again. Uh, we have this true displacement time step and we have our error, the same as last time. The example I'm gonna show is random walk which is time integrated white noise. So this is the same as you saw before, and there's our first data point. But as we increase in time, we now add that second error to the first error. These are now correlated with each other. The second error has knowledge of the first error, and we are simply going to sum those errors as we go through time. And hopefully you'll see that at the end of the time, we are now further away in our estimate to the true displacement, cumulative displacement. And that means that this error bar needs to be larger than it was in the white noise only case. Let's see that final time step. So this must be taken into account in order to produce what we call more realistic velocity uncertainties. This is a statistical um, approach and it does not, uh, it deals with the statistics of the, time, the position time series that you produce and it doesn't account for other unmodeled errors elsewhere in the system. So as I said before, Simon Williams um, has dealt with this a lot and produced a program called CATS, Create and Analyze Time Series, um, which is a maximum likelihood estimator for a chosen noise model and it will solve for the initial position and velocity, uh, seasonal cycles if you want to, and it will estimate that exponent K of the power law noise model if you want, or you can fix it to say minus one to have a white noise plus flicker noise model. This requires, um, the installation of CATS requires some linear algebra libraries, LAS and LAPAC to be installed, pretty common nowadays. Uh, for more information on installing this, based on my experience, you can go to this website. Um, the code used to be here, um, but I think this, this web page no longer exists. The source code no longer seems to available, uh, be available. And I think that this is a sign that CATS has been deprecated and superseded by another uh, program called Hector, uh, which Simon Williams was um, also a contributor to. So Hector, here's the reference for Hector. It's much the same as CATS, but uses a slightly faster algorithm uh, based on some assumptions with the uh, mathematical uh, background of the algorithm. Uh, same things uh, can be estimated 
As of uh, some more recent versions, you can also estimate changes in velocity and non-linear motions in the presence of these noise models. Uh, it requires Atlas libraries, um, but pre-compiled executables are generally available now. It's, it's tricky otherwise to install because of the Atlas requirement. Um, but you can go here and see if there's pre-compiled executables for your system. We have uh, two scripts, shcats and shhector, which will help you run cats or hector uh, using the uh, .pos files, time series files from Globe K. It will output velocities in our vel file format and also calculate the MAR NEU commands for putting into your Globe K command file when you run Globe K to do the velocity solution. Just be aware, again, this can take a very long time. Um, so it can take a day or two to run through many, many time series. Um, but uh, you know, it, it is possible to do that. We're not gonna to talk too much about these because they do use CATS and Hector, which are not gamut Globe K programs. They are third party programs produced and maintained by other people. So what about a quicker way of doing things? Um, we could look into approximations and some people have found in the past that there is a relationship between the white noise that's estimated and a temporally correlated version of the noise. Uh, Mao et al found that there was this sort of uh, almost one-to-one -one correlation between the white noise estimate and the follicle noise estimate. And that might suggest to us that we can actually rescale the uncertainties based on an assumption of how much temporally correlated noise uh, we have. We have developed, we have developed a slightly more um, statistically based uh, algorithm, which we call the FOGMEX or Realistic Sigma Algorithm. FOGMEX stands for First Order Gauss-Markov Extrapolation. And so this is uh, using a sort of similar statistical approach uh, means that it can be handled computationally very efficiently. Uh, it will handle time series with varying lengths and data gaps well. Uh, data gaps tend to be a big problem for the spectral or the maximum likelihood estimators that we saw before. Sorry, they're not spectral, they're maximum likelihood estimate, est estimators, uh, cats and hector. And we can similarly obtain um, uh, data that we use in Globe K uh, with those MAR NEU um, commands. So the concept here is that we said before that the white noise uncertainty should go down with the square root of n observations. If we fail that test, that shows that there's probably some kind of correlated noise. And so we could use averaging of the time series uh, with different uh, numbers of contributing uh, contributing data points to see if this uh, um, RMS value, the reduction in noise, does indeed behave as the square root of n. We would then fit the values um, to a chi-squared distribution as a function of averaging time and the first order Gauss-Markov model uh, says that we should have an exponential function when we plot that uh, relative to the averaging time. And we would fit an amplitude and a correlation time uh, to that first order Gauss-Markov model. Uh, an infinite correlation time for the first order Gauss-Markov model is a special case that is equivalent to uh, a random walk uh, value. And those random walk values is actually what we expect for the MAR NEU command in the globe K Calm filter. So we can do some uh, calculation between by projecting this, um, this function through to infinite time. We take the asymptote and that will be our, our equivalent random walk magnitude. So the extrapolation, um, again for independent noise we expect uh, a relationship of one over the square root of n data, um, but for temporally correlated noise we use the uh, chi-squared uh, <coughs> chi-squared per degree of freedom over ever increasing window sizes and then extrapolate that uh, to infinite time by taking the, taking the asymptote of this function, uh, the exponential of uh, minus the sigma, uh, that's the asymptote we're looking for, 
uh, as a function of, of tau, which is the window length here. Um, so here you can see the averaging time in days and the chi-squared of the residuals going up here and the asymptote would, would uh, go off into infinite time here. Um, from that we can understand exactly what the uh, variance of the time series should be if it was of infinite time. This is another way of actually us assuming that we know what the very long, free, the long period, low frequency parts of the um, spectrum would look like. So let's look at uh, that in uh, how TS fit, uh, sorry, TS view uh, would, would see that problem. Here we have a time series in yellow, a raw time series in yellow from uh, a site uh, CVHS. And in blue, we see the seven day average. So immediately with the seven day average, you can see that a lot of these noisy outliers are reduced to a nice smooth curve, but we still see the uh, longer period, lower frequencies in there. So what we're gonna do is if we averaged over longer and longer periods, we want to see what happens uh, to this, this scatter. You know, does it reduce? And what importantly, what happens to these weighted RMS and normalized RMS statistics? Um, so we're gonna be looking at the east component in the next slide. So that's this one here. Let's make a note of some of the statistics. Uh, the weighted RMS is 0.9, the normalized RMS is 0.5, and the velocity error, velocity uncertainty is 0 0.01 millimeters per year. If we were to have uh, a white noise, um, uh, white, white noise purely in this uh, time series, we would expect the weighted normalized RMS to reduce with the square root of n. Um, so our, our effective number of points in the blue line is seven times fewer than in the yellow because we've done a seven day averaging. So the effective number of points in blue has been reduced by seven. Uh, so we would expect this to reduce by the square root of seven uh, when taking the yellow time series to the blue time series. We would also expect the normalized RMS to stay approximately the same. Um, so here we show the averaging with 64 days average, uh, 100 days average and 400 days average. And those averages are shown in the um, the, the, red, uh, the, the red here. Um, so you can see that as we average long, uh, more and more over longer and longer time periods, we smooth out these shorter period lower frequency variations. So for reference, we uh, say again, uh, the previous slide we saw the weighted RMS was 0.9, the normalized RMS was 0.5. In these cases, the WRMS is uh, 0.7. In the 100 day case, it's 0.6. Now, uh, this, this really should be reducing down to about uh, 0.1, uh, sorry, 0 0.01. Um, uh, I beg your pardon, 0 0.1. Uh, if we had 0 0.9, that's nearly a millimeter for the daily WRMS, one over the square root of 100 is 10. So we would expect the WRMS to be 10 times less, uh, about 0 0.1, 0 0.09 millimeters. And that's just not the case here we're still seeing variations. We don't have a, a weighted RMS that is reducing by that square root of N um, model. And we also have a normalized RMS that is actually increasing as well. So this shows us that there are temporal correlations here that we need to account for. And now we could potentially use these statistics, the deviation of the statistics from the expected white noise model to come up with an idea of how uh, this velocity uncertainty should be rescaled. And we do that uh, with, the, uh, with the FOGMEX algorithm. And when we rescale the uncertainties uh, to account for the deviation between the expected white noise square root of n reduction uh, versus what we actually see as we model uh, more longer and longer windows, uh, we see that the uh, actual errors are more like uh, 0 0.09 millimeters per year in the north component, 
0.13 millimeters per year in the yeast component. These two numbers were 0.1, uh, sorry, 0 0.01 millimeters per year in the daily white noise assumption. So they have been increased um, by uh, a, a, an order of magnitude, essentially. Um, and uh, that, that really shows you the difference. If we see velocity uncertainties that are much below 0.1 millimeters per year, maybe below 0.05 millimeters per year, they are simply unrealistic and people have not dealt with this, um, this uh, time series analysis part properly. So we can compare our algorithm, the FOGMAX algorithm, with the Hector algorithm, and that's what we've done in these graphs, which come from a recent publication of ours detailing the FOGMAX algorithm and making some comparisons to the, um, uh, the, the, the estimator, the, the, um, the spectral analysis, and the maximum likelihood estimators of Hector. In black are the hectare estimates. This is one site. These are just number, the number of sites. We did about 20 sites. Uh, so the black uh, is the estimate from hectare of the velocity with the error bars being the, the velocity uncertainty. In red is the time series analysis using TS fit with the Kalman filter uh, switched on, which, is, which uses the MAR NEU commands that we usually use in Globe K, we actually can use them in TS fit as well. In blue are the weighted least squares estimates from TS fit with the rescaled uncertainty. And what you can see here in the details, uh, I'll just explain it, is that Hector uh, usually has an error bar that's slightly larger than our TS fit um, error bars, but with the uh, statistical analysis that we do on the time series, we're getting a pretty good estimate. We are matching the more rigorous estimate very well in terms of the uh, velocity uh, bias and also the velocity uncertainty that we estimate. This is for a synthetic time series with no breaks. This is for a synthetic time series with discontinuities, uh, which can affect the way that the, the noise model is, uh, is dealt with before and after this discontinuity. But again, we see very similar patterns. So we are confident that our very quick uh, assumption-based statistical analysis of the time series matches a rigorous um, uh, estimator uh, very well. Uh, our, uh, our approach takes much less time than the, uh, the Hector analysis uh, by an order of magnitude again. Um, so our analysis is very quick and seems to reproduce the results fairly well. So there's a summary of these practical approaches, the algorithm approaches that we have. Um, but all, all of these approaches require some common sense and verification ideally against the environment that you expect to see. So let's take a look at that now. Here's an example of the external validation of the velocity uncertainties compared with a physical model. Here, this is um, the Aegean down here. So we're looking at Northern Greece, um, Bulgaria, uh, Macedonia. Um, and uh, here we are looking at an area of central or southern uh, Macedonia, uh, which is uh, considered to be tectonically stable. So ideally we should see when we estimate uh, how these uh, velocities here move, ideally we should have residuals that are all zero because they should all be moving as one in a, in a tectonically uh, consistent way. We have plotted the, error uh, the errors here based on our uh, velocity analysis at 70% confidence, which means that at this level of confidence, if our error analysis is correct, and if our tectonic assumption is correct, we should see about 30% failing the test of having a statistically zero velocity. So here you can see the velocity arrow lies well within the uncertainty. That is a statistically insignificant velocity. It's basically zero when it comes to the confidence limit. But here we can see one velocity Error, uh, vector that pierces its error ellipse. So this is uh, a vector that fails the test at 70% confidence that it moves 
relative to the other sites in a consistent fashion. And we see a few of those, about four or five. There's 17 in total, approximately in this circle. Um, so that is about 30% of 17. So this error uh, analysis that we've done seems to be valid for our geological assumption, our geological model. Now, if we plot the error ellipses at 95%, we should only see 5% of the vectors fail this test. And here you can see a couple of them, maybe a third one here. But there's now only one to two of those velocities that pierce the error ellipses. Again, that shows us that at 95% confidence, we have an appropriate level of uncertainty estimation for the geological model that we assume. We can also do this with more complicated geolo geological models. Um, here's a more complicated geological model uh, in the northwest of the US and, and southwest of Canada, the Cascadia subduction zone. Um, here we assume that there is locking on this subduction zone um, and we want to test our geological model. So what we're going to do is uh, take an area away from the deformation where we think it's more stable tectonically and uh, so we don't have an influence of the model. We just want to look at an area that is independent of or insensitive to the details of the model here by the subduction zone. So we look inland uh, to our network here to assess that model. Here is the uh, velocity solution uh, at 70% uh, error for 300 observations. Uh, and next slide, we'll look at that inland area only um, approximately east of three, uh, 238 east. So here again, uh, we plotted at 70% confidence and we can see a few of these outliers. Uh, there's about 13, 14, maybe 17 of these outlier sites here in amongst the 73 uh, sites plotted in this slowly deforming region. The rest of them have statistically zero velocity relative to their uncertainties. So again, this shows that our uh, uncertainty, our velocity estimation, our uncertainties on the velocities are appropriate for our level of confidence. And this shows you the details of what happened here. Uh, so for these 70 sites, we, we plot uh, the accumulative distribution of the velocity magnitude, that's the vector length, divided by the uncertainty, that's the size of the error ellipse, and we plot the number of those velocities that uh, fall within the ratio. So the ratio of velocity divided by uncertainty of one, as we have the velocity uncertainty divided by uh, is two, we see more sites that, that, uh, that fulfill this criteria and so on and so on. The uh, curve here is the theoretical chi-square or chi distribution given 0.5 uh, millimeters of, of uh, uh, or random, war, uh, random noise and then one millimeter of random warp noise. Um, and what if we change uh, these numbers? How will that affect this histogram relative to the chi distribution? Well, if we uh, reduce the level of random warp noise, you can see here that in the upper part of the histogram, we are now deviating from the theoretical chi distribution. And if we uh, increase the white noise and increase the random warp noise, we again show a big deviation compared to that, uh, that, um, that theoretical chi distribution. Uh, so for details of this, you can see uh, McCaffrey's paper. Um, I think it's in the last slide is the details. So to summarize briefly, we have uh, lots of algorithms uh, for computing estimates of the standard deviations. Um, and uh, we fundamentally need to understand that lower frequency, long period part of the noise spectrum, uh, which is poorly determined without very long time series. There is always uh, an assumption of stationarity uh, in these uh, noise uh, uh, time series estimates. What that means is that the noise characteristics do not change over time. Uh, we're not sure if this is valid. Um, for example, if there was an earthquake with major hydrological changes after the earthquake, that might introduce a different type of noise after the earthquake compared to the beginning of the earthquake, or before the earthquake, whereas at the moment we only deal with stationary noise in these algorithms. 
The FogMix algorithm, or real, what we used to call realistic sigma algorithm, is very convenient, quick, and seemingly reliable relative to other more rigorous approaches such as CATS and Hector. And uh, it's always a good idea to uh, compare your velocity residuals compared to uh, a well-known physical model like a tectonically rigid area or consistent area to see if the uncertainties are validated uh, or validates the, the error model. And that brings to an end uh, this discussion, uh, this talk, we'll end there.